Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We'll begin our presentation now. I'd like to welcome you to the IUPUI Center for Translating Research into Practice annual keynote address. My name is Steve Viweg, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center, and it is my great pleasure to host this year's keynote address. The IUPUI Center for Translating Research into Practice was founded by Dr. Sandra Petronio, Professor of Communication Studies, who is an achieved translational scholar and serves as the Director of the Center for Privacy Management at IUPUI. Her work in privacy management is particularly pertinent these days as we navigate the increased use of virtual technologies. When Dr. Petronio and Chancellor Emeritus Charles Bantz first came to IUPUI, they recognized our campus was the most translational they had ever experienced. They also noticed that we're a modest campus that doesn't always boast about our good work. And that began Dr. Petronio's quest to recognize and appreciate the many unique examples of research that seek to address questions and challenges that solve problems, fee, problems that people face in their everyday lives by using meaningful evidence-based information to address complex social, health, governmental, cultural, and relational issues that we face in our communities. IUPUI is well known as an integral partner with our Indianapolis and Indiana community. And right now, during a pandemic, is no exception to the value of our partnerships. There's so much to explore and understand as we engage our amazing students, staff, faculty, and community partners in translational research that makes the world a better place. Now, while Chancellor Dr. Bantz encouraged the celebration and expansion of translational work as part of the fabric of our campus, now as executive director, he continues to promote this work through a wide variety of programs, including today's keynote address. Speaking of technology, we are taking advantage of Zoom to make this keynote address available to the community today. You may have noticed in the pre-show slides, we're recording today's session for those who are unable to join. And we ask you to stay muted during the presentation and we'll have a chance to take questions and comments later during the dialogue portion of this presentation. You can either share your questions in the chat or we can invite you to unmute later on. But for now, just hold your questions. So to take advantage of our limited time, we're so delighted to have a keynote address to invite somebody outside of our campus to talk about their translational work. Today, we bring you Dean Bernadette Masaryk Melnick from the Ohio State University School of Nursing. Dr. Melnick is recognized nationally and globally for both her clinical knowledge and her innovative approaches to a wide range of healthcare challenges. Her groundbreaking work spans evidence-based practice, intervention research, child and adolescent mental health, and health and wellness. Throughout her impressive career, she's received many accolades and awards, but we are most anxious to invite her today to share her translational research around the important and timely topic of healthcare with our IUPUI community here. So please help me welcome Dean Melnick to share her presentation, Speeding the Translation of Research into Real World Community Settings to Improve Health Outcomes, a Call to Action. So please let her join us and uh, bring her slides to the screen and take over. Welcome, Dean Melnick. Thank you, Steve. Charles and Nuri, I am so delighted to be with all of you today. It has been one character building year and I hope you and your families are well. Can you see my slide, Steve? Yes, we can, you're good. Okay, terrific. I would like to just um, first disclose conflict of the interest. I have a company called Cope to Thrive that disseminates my research-based COPE programs that I am going to be talking about today. I want to start off with a little bit of my personal story because it has relevance to my presentation today. I grew up 
in a small little coal mining town called Republic, Pennsylvania, one hour southwest of Pittsburgh near the West Virginia border. The town's population was a thousand. My dad was a coal miner. We lived in half of a little company house. I'm sure we were probably labeled working poor, but I was born with rose colored glasses on and I still can make lemonade out of lemons any day. That resiliency came in so handy when I was a teenager, 15 years of age, home alone with my mom when she sneezed, stroked out and died right in front of me. Well, you can imagine how traumatic that was for me as a teen. I suffered from terrible post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety for a few years after her death. But after about four months of nightmares, not eating, not sleeping well, not functioning well in school, I was taken to my family physician because there were, were no counselors in my little town. That physician did what so many providers still do today, got out the prescription pad, wrote a script for Valium, said, give Burn one of these every night she'll sleep and be just fine. Well, I remember taking a Valium that night and I slept for the first time in months, but I woke up the next morning groggy. I didn't feel like myself. And I said, I don't like this feeling. I don't wanna take this anymore. I just got to gut it up and cope. But in the next four years, not only did I lose my mom, I lost a cousin who was like a brother to me in a car accident. I lost the only grandparent I ever knew and loved. And at age 19, my dad had his heart attack. That's a lot of grief for an adolescent. But you know the story. What doesn't break us only makes us stronger. And as a result of what I went through as an adolescent, I became passionate to become a nurse, then a pediatric nurse practitioner, then a psychiatric nurse practitioner, and go on and get my PhD so I could develop and test mental health interventions to improve depression, anxiety, in children, teens, and college students who were suffering without help like I did. Well, the saddest part of my story, my mother had a history of headaches for over a year. And my dad kept saying, would you go to the doctor, figure out what's wrong? She visited her family physician just one week 
before she died, diagnosed with high blood pressure, given a prescription for a blood pressure medication that my dad found in her purse after she died. She never took it. So now I think you're going to understand why I'm so passionate about wellness and prevention. And nine years ago, I left sunny Arizona for Columbus, Ohio, because I got a chance to pioneer one of my dreams. And that was to be the first chief wellness officer at a university in the country. Well, I have long had a philosophy in God we trust, but everybody else better bring data to the table. I really started pushing the evidence-based practice movement in nursing back in the 90s when research utilization was the thing. Evidence-based practice had been in medicine for about 20 years, but nursing really lagged behind. Well, if you remember in 2003, the Institute of Medicine formed a summit and they said all healthcare professionals will be educated to deliver patient-centric care as members of an interdisciplinary team emphasizing evidence-based practice. And their recommendation was that by 2020, 90% of healthcare decisions will be evidence-based. I would like to tell you We've met that goal, but there is so much opportunity in front of us. Right now, it still takes decades to see our research translated into real world clinical settings to improve the outcomes. Many of you might remember this famous figure that was included in this landmark paper back in 2000, the 17 year odyssey. But I say that's 17 years if you're blessed. Most researchers never still to this day get a chance to really see their research translated to the real world to improve outcomes. Well, the gap between what we know and what we do is what I call lethal. We have got to get so much quicker at taking the findings from research and quickly moving them into clinical settings. I was on the Hill advocating right before the pandemic hit. And I had a legislator say to me, Vern, don't tell us you need more money funding for specific programs because we don't have more money. So do you have a solution for us? And I said, absolutely. 
let's de-implement what isn't evidence-based and use that money for programming in our hospitals, in our community settings that is evidence-based. That legislator said to me, well, that's gonna be a tough long haul because we have so many legislators that have their pet programs that they have supported for years and years. And it would mean giving those up. Well, implementation science is the scientific study of methods and strategies that facilitate the uptake of the evidence-based practice and research into regular use by clinicians and policy makers. The field of implementation science seeks to systematically close that gap by identifying and addressing barriers that slow the uptake of research-based interventions and evidence-based guidelines into practice. Our country spends more money on healthcare than any Western world country, yet we rank near the bottom in health outcomes. One major reason is because even though we have all these evidence-based guidelines and research-based interventions, we are not good at rapidly translating them into practice. I could give you tons of examplers, but one that hits home to me very hard is the fact that we have a higher maternal death rate than most of Western world countries. 700 moms die every single year in childbirth, many of them needlessly because clinicians aren't following the latest evidence-based guidelines for complications such as high blood pressure and hemorrhage. Well, despite the fact that we have all these wonderful evidence-based interventions that could be translated more quickly, we still have so many things across our country that are being done with no or very little evidence. Here's an example, the tongue patch for weight loss. This was covered on 2020, a couple of years ago. In fact, you can Google it. They interviewed a surgeon in California who started this procedure. It actually started in Mexico, sewing a little nubby plastic patch with six sutures to the anterior of the tongue. A reporter interviewed this surgeon, by the way, it'll cost you a couple thousand dollars if you want this done. And if you don't get it removed in 30 days, it begins to adhere to your tongue. The reporter said to the surgeon, what evidence do you have behind this tongue patch? That physician actually responded, I have the anecdotal evidence it's working in the women that I'm using it on. The reporter said, 
Well, how does it work? This was the answer. It creates so much pain to swallow anything but liquid. It's like a behavioral modification device. What is the definition of insanity? This is it. But yet, we have so many great evidence-based interventions that aren't being used in the real world. Well, I could share for an hour or two all the barriers that exist. Here's one that's classic in so many healthcare systems. Why are you doing this this way? Because we've always done it that way. Our Fold Institute for Evidence-Based Practice actually passes out these buttons. And I was able to give a bunch to our prior Surgeon General because he said, I'm tired of hearing this because we've always done it that way. On the flip side of the coin, we know through science, there are key organizational contextual factors that help translation, culture, leadership, communication, and networks resources, champions. I call those champions in the model I created that I'll talk about at tomorrow's lecture. I call them mentors. And then evaluation, monitoring, and feedback. But other very key implementation factors include the evidence and is it quality behind the intervention, people's beliefs about its efficacy and its value because people's beliefs affect their behaviors. And if somebody doesn't believe this intervention is worthwhile. They're probably not gonna implement it or have fidelity if they are implementing it. Support as well as costs. So I've published an intervention research book and in it, we talk about so what outcomes, factors that are critical to measure in an era of healthcare reform. Key questions that I ask anybody when you wanna form a study, so what will be the end outcome of the study or the project? So what difference will this study or project make in improving healthcare quality, costs, or patient outcomes? Return on investment, cost outcomes are so critical to include in our studies and in our projects, because whether we like it or not, we live in a cost-driven healthcare system. And if a C-suite is gonna consider translating an evidence-based intervention into their organization, they're gonna to wanna to know how much money is this going to save us in addition to how much is this going to cost? I had to learn about the so what outcomes the hard way. I started my career, my research career, by developing and testing a COPE program for parents, 
of critically ill children and preterm babies. So after several studies, some were pilots, I received another big NIH grant to conduct a multi-site study testing my COPE parent program with parents of preterm babies. To this date, I have published all my other studies that, that showed the same thing as this clinical trial. When parents of preemies got this program, they were less depressed, less anxious, they had less post-traumatic stress disorder, and their babies did better developmentally up to three years of age. So I had been publishing this research, doing keynotes all over the world on it. And after almost 17 years, I did not have one hospital in this country or throughout the world that was implementing this wonderful, easily implementable program in the NICU. Now this study, I decided I'm gonna factor in cost outcomes. So I measured length of stay. This is what we found. Premies of parents who got this COPE program. It, it's an educational skills building program. We were discharged earlier, four days earlier, eight days earlier if the babies were under 32 weeks. Once I published this data, and the cost effectiveness analysis that showed we could save the US healthcare system two and a half to $5 billion a year if every parent of a preemie got COPE. Once I published those findings, my phone rang off the hook. Burn, we love this program. How can we get it? Can you come and train our staff? How much does it cost? I asked them, why do you want to implement this in your neonatal intensive care unit? The number one answer I got, because burn, it's going to reduce our length of stay and save us costs. It took me measuring this so what outcome before my intervention started translating very rapidly throughout the United States. I had the pleasure to go to Switzerland and England and teach hospitals there how to implement and cope. But again, if I wouldn't have shown cost outcome data, I'd still be banging the drum for this program. Well, a mental health epidemic existed in our nation prior to the pandemic. Now we have a mental health pandemic inside of a COVID-19 pandemic. One out of three people in this country are suffering from clinical anxiety or depression. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in 10 to 34 year olds. In August, the CDC MMWR report came out that showed 25% of our college age, 18 to 24 year olds had thought about suicide 
since the pandemic struck. So not only do we have issues right now with mental health, we also have issues with unhealthy lifestyle behaviors that are skyrocketing as people attempt to cope with COVID. Increased uses of alcohol and drugs, increase in unhealthy eating and declines in physical activity. We are gonna see the downstream adverse effects of this pandemic. We have one out of two people right now who have a chronic disease, yet 80%, 80% of chronic disease is totally preventable with a few healthy lifestyle behaviors. We're going to see chronic diseases escalate even more three years from now, five, 10 years from now, because of what has happened during this pandemic. So I started to develop my COPE Cognitive Behavior Therapy based program over 25 years ago when I was consulting for a child and adolescent inpatient unit at upstate New York. It was a unit of about 18 beds. These children and teens went to school every day in our center. And I was astounded by the fact these children and teens were receiving psycho meds like crazy, but they weren't getting first line evidence-based treatment, which we know is cognitive behavior therapy. So I said, what happens if when I teach them their weekly health course, which I was asked to do, if I manualize cognitive behavior therapy and I did it in a way that was developmentally sensitive to their ages and any other healthcare provider could deliver it, even if they were not a mental health provider, because we have a severe shortage of mental health providers. So I developed another COPE. This is called the COPE Healthy Lifestyle Teen Program. The basis of it is seven sessions of cognitive behavioral skills building. I took all the key concepts from CBT and again, manualized them into a structured seven week program for these kids. I also integrated eight sessions of nutrition and physical activity. I had the kids do 20 minutes of movement physical activity in the classroom after we covered the content and skills. CBT, the key premise, is how we think affects how we feel and how we behave. The root cause of a lot of depression, stress, anxiety, is negative automatic thinking. We don't even realize we have anymore because it's habituated. Well, I proposed that this CBT-based intervention would improve their knowledge, their beliefs, would decrease their perceived difficulty about being able to self-regulate and perform healthy lifestyle behaviors 
And I predicted as a result of them receiving the CBT-based skills building programs, we would see positive outcomes across a variety of areas. This program like CBT teaches the ABCs, monitoring for stressors that we often can't control, catching our negative thoughts, turning them around so we feel better and engage in healthier behaviors. Well, we also know mindfulness integrated CBT helps to prevent relapse. So mindfulness is a part of this program as well. The kids set goals each week. They monitor their emotions and they get what I call skills building activities after each of the sessions because you've got to put into practice what you're learning. You'll see what I cover in these sessions. So again, the first seven sessions are all CBT based. The rest of the sessions focus on healthy eating, physical activity. And the last session really helps them to pull it all together a review of the major content. Well, I ended up getting NIH funded again for a large multi-site trial. 11 schools were randomly assigned to get COPE or an attention control program. I did a training workshop for the teachers because I wanted the teachers to deliver this once a week in the health course for 50 minute sessions. I wanted teachers to deliver this so it would be scalable if we found it worked well, which we did. In our trial, the COPE teams engaged in much higher levels of physical activity. The students who started the trial with severe depression were no longer depressed after the intervention. Alcohol use was less. Social academic outcomes were much higher in the teens who went through COPE. The so what outcome in this particular study was this academic outcome because I knew if principals, if superintendents saw the findings, they would really get excited that the COPE teens had higher academic performance than the control group. The other thing we found though, because the teens were more physically active over time, their BMI was less. In fact, no teens in the COPE group converted from overweight to obese up to 12 months after the intervention ended. So when I published this particular data, the National Cancer Institute called me and said, Burn, we see your findings. We want to consider your program for the research tested intervention program that we have here at the National Cancer Institute. So I submitted everything they asked for 
And about a year later, this co-program is recognized and on the website of the National Cancer Institute with the highest dissemination capability. This has also helped to translate this intervention and scale it all throughout the United States and five countries now. After I saw the wonderful outcomes I was having with the 15 session program, I decided let's just pull out the seven CBT sessions and let's test them with children, teens and college students who are depressed or anxious. We now have 22 studies that all show the same thing. When children, teens, and college students get this seven weekly session, cognitive behavior skills building program, their self-esteem increases, their anxiety, depressive symptoms, suicidal ideation drops, and their healthy lifestyle behaviors and academic performance improves. So last year, I did another cost analysis and published that. Findings indicated the cost savings of $14,000 plus for every hospitalization that is prevented with this program. This program, I'm so excited, is being reimbursed for primary care providers to deliver this in primary pediatric family practice settings. It's now used in all 50 states, five countries, the CPT code for reimbursement is 99214. But schools have adopted it, community mental health settings, FQHCs, even private counseling practices are using it. Mental health counselors and psychologists because the program is structured. The kids know what to expect when they come into every single session. Well, we must shift our paradigm from crisis intervention and sick care to well care and building resiliency cognitive behavioral skills and protective factors in our children and in us. Our country only invests 8% of our healthcare spending in prevention. So again, it's not surprising why we have so much chronic disease in this country. We would not send children into a deep ocean without an oxygen tank. How can we send our children, our teens, our college students throughout life without giving them evidence-based coping cognitive behavioral skills that we know through research work. I told a group of 160 APLU presidents this last fall before the pandemic hit. I said, this can't be optional. This must be built in. We need to onboard our college students with these types of skills when they enter our universities, our children when they enter our school system. 
My dream is that every child, teen, and college student in the world learns the skills that we teach in this program for a world for children and teens that's free from mental health disorders and chronic disease and a world in which every child achieves optimal well-being and succeeds academically and in life. Well, I was funded for another R01 a few years ago. We are conducting a multi-site clinical trial between Columbus and the Bronx. We adapted this co-program for high-risk minority pregnant women who are depressed and anxious. So they are receiving this co-program as a small group-based intervention program. Six intervention sessions over the course of pregnancy, and then we're following them through birth and six months after. Well, it took me only 10 years of pitching a dream to the Helene Fold Health Trust out of New York City that we needed a national institute to help speed translation of research evidence into practice at a much faster rate. I'll never forget after 10 years of pitching this dream, going in New York City to meet with this trustee, after 10 years, she looked at me and said, Vern, how much would it cost you to launch this National Institute? The biggest gift they ever gave was $6 million. I'm a competitive Buckeye, so I said six and a half million. And she looked at me and said, I think I get it now. I think we can do it. Don't give up on your dreams. So many people give up right before their seed would pop and it would grow like crazy. Any dream worth having is worth persisting. So I'm gonna finish my talk with just some tips of advice for your own personal health and wellness. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer technically in America. One out of three men and women die from cardiovascular disease. But if we take into consideration all causes of death and disease in the United States, it's really our behaviors that are the number one killer. Physical inactivity, unhealthy eating, alcohol and drug use, smoking. But I'm very serious when I share Beware of your chair. I stand at a standing desk for the majority of my days because evidence from research shows if we sit just three hours a day, we increase our cardiac risk by 30%. If we sit five a day, that's comparable to smoking one and a quarter packs of cigarettes every single day. The good news about behaviors being our number one killer, we have control over them. The not so good news is most people don't change their behavior unless crisis happens or their emotions are raised. So it's evidence plus emotion 
that gets people to embark on behavior change. I want you to watch this clip now and think about what you're doing for your own self-care now and what you're not. And if you keep doing or not doing what you're doing, what is the last 10 years of your life going to look like? What will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment. Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. That's a very powerful clip that I'm encouraging our health sciences students to show their patients, to spur on some emotion, to maybe get them to start embarking a little bit more on healthy behaviors. You heard my history. I have bad genes. I could get up every morning and say, I'm gonna die from a heart attack or a stroke at a young age like my mom did. But research shows us more than our genes, social circumstances, the healthcare we get, it's really our behaviors that's the biggest contributor to premature death. I did not fabricate this slide. This is a real fitness facility in the state of California. And you have a choice. You can either walk the stairs or take the escalator to go work out at the gym. A group of psychologists studied how many people during the course of a day during a week would choose the stairs instead of the escalator. They're finding only two people a day. So if I have to give everybody an evidence-based recipe for how to cut your risk of chronic disease by these numbers, this is all I would tell you you have to do. 30 minutes of physical activity, five days a week. People say, you're crazy, Vern. I don't have that time. And I say, sure you do. Doesn't have to be at once. Cut your meeting times down. Don't do 60 minutes. Do 50 minute meetings at least three times a day to give yourself 10 minute micro recovery breaks to walk up and down steps, do some jumping jacks, just move more, sit less. You're going to have much more energy too if you move more. Five fruits and veggies a day. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Don't start drinking alcohol if you don't right now. But if you do, one standard size per day. Because everybody asks me, Burn, how big can that drink be? And I tell them not the size of the alcoholic beverages we get in Vegas. But sadly, only 6%, 6% of our American population only engages in these five leading health behaviors. So I'm going to ask you, consider today, February 24th, your July 1. I want you to take just one of the behaviors, evidence-based, that I showed you and say, for the next 30 days, I'm going to just get a little better. 
If you do 10 minutes of physical activity twice a week, don't go to 30 minutes five days a week. Go to 15 minutes two days a week. Work your way up. You can do it. My main reasons for engaging in physical activity, eating healthy, are my three beautiful daughters, my two grandsons, my two character building pugs. See, who's going to be your motivator? You can't keep pouring from an empty cup, which is so important every day to take a little time to take good self-care. Because if we don't take the time for that now, we are going to need to take the time for chronic disease later. I didn't have a mom to see me graduate from high school, college, go on to have this beautiful family. Think about your motivators, people who want you to be around for a super long time. And if I can't motivate you enough, this little girl is going to motivate you to keep dreaming, discovering, and delivering. your dreams be dreams. Yesterday you said tomorrow. So just do it. Make your dreams come true. Just, just do it. Some people dreamers are obsessed and you're going to wake up and we're going to work hard at it. Nothing is impossible. You should get to a point where anyone else will quit. And you're not going to stop there. No, what are you waiting for? Just do it. Just, just do it. Yes, you can. Just do it. I love that. What a way to motivate. And if you want daily doses of motivation, follow me on Twitter at Bern Malnick. So I'd be happy to take any questions now. Thank you so much for your presentation and for inspiring us and uh, giving us lots to think about. There were two questions that came up in the chat that are similar, so I will combine them together. And what I'm hearing the folks say is that you suggested some great um, practical things that could be used. And so the question is, if it's uh, around economic savings, is that a way we should focus on the so what? And then what can we do to get policymakers, legislators to understand this? Like what, what how do we make this work? <laughs> And I, I asked that too, because I actually said to a, a staffer one time, I can bring you evidence that shows if we spend a dollar here, we save seven there. And he says, that's great, because we only make decisions based on evidence. And I said, no, you don't. So what do I do? <laughs> I know. We have to keep pounding the drum, seriously, on this. We got to keep pounding the drum. And it's like I told that legislator, please, let's de-implement. Do you know we fund so many things that aren't evidence-based and then we can't fund these things, these really good things that are evidence-based. But I'm serious, all the people I mentor, right at the start of their study design, we talk about the so what outcome. And you can measure these, because we do. We still measure a lot of warm and fuzzy outcomes. And if you still want to do that, that's fine. But think about one, so what outcome, like cost, that you can measure that's going to help you scale your intervention much faster. If I would have, I mean, I would have died such an unhappy camper if I spent 35 years 
doing all this research, showing all these great findings, and then nobody's using them. You know, I've published up the wazoo, I've presented up the wazoo, but my goal, improve population health. And the way I can do that is to make sure I've got a so what outcome in all of the studies that I do. Well, thank you for that suggestion. And I think um, part of the so what question is really appropriate for our IUPUI community. We have such a great connection with the community and we can build that into our discussions and, and help let the community help us figure out what some of that so what could be as well, how we could make things better. Well, we are short on time and I know you're coming back to speak with us again tomorrow and everyone is welcome to attend that session. Even if you came today, you're welcome to come tomorrow. It is focused on campus. So we're, we've asked, um, she's focusing a little bit more on the academic side, but that still includes all of us. It doesn't matter whether you're a community member or a student, um, just anyone interested, please join us for tomorrow's session. And then we have- we um, I yes. have to say before I sign off for my next Zoom, go Hoosiers and go <laughs> Buckeyes. So it was great to be with all of you. And what we'll say to close out our session is that we have other activities going on with our center. And uh, in fact, on Friday, we have our one of our uh, conversation sessions with our Scholars of the Month. So please join us. You can hear from Lasana Kasembe who will be talking about uh, the living tradition, pedagogy, arts, learning, and the liberatory praxis. And we invite you to come to our uh, website and uh, check out all the things that are going on in the center. And you can follow us as well it, around, um, you can join our Twitter feed, our Facebook page, and always go to the website to find out more information. So please come join us. And uh, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow for those that can, can attend. Thank you so much for coming today.